Citizen Kane works as both an intense character study and a noir style mystery. In an odd way, it's also sort of a 1941 era version of HBO's Succession or even Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. But the plot of Citizen Kane all revolves around one word, Rosebud. But what does Rosebud mean and what is Citizen Kane really about? I'll explain, but first, let's start with a major spoiler. If you don't wanna be spoiled, click away. Ready? Rosebud is Charles Foster Kane's childhood sled. Pretty simple, but that sled has a much deeper meaning that's core to understanding Citizen Kane's story. My name is Jay Shear. I'm a screenwriter, a film producer, and I recently directed my first film, No Vacancy. In today's video, I'm breaking down Orson Welles' 1941 film, Citizen Kane. One of the reasons Citizen Kane is considered by many to be one of the best films of all time, it's number one on the American Film Institute's Top 100, is because it influenced thousands of films that have come out since. And the film's opening sequence is part of that unique and formidable filmmaking style. Newsreel footage introduces us to Charles Foster Kane. It showcases his Florida estate, Xanadu, a mansion that rivals Hearst Castle, Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago, and even Michael Jackson's Neverland Ranch. Though it's unfinished, the sprawling estate contains priceless artifacts from across the world. But Charles Foster Kane, quite possibly one of the most famous men in the United States, if not the world, has just died. And in this newsreel obituary, we learn a little bit more about him. Welcome to News on the March. Charles Foster Kane was insanely rich. He built a media empire, and he interacted with world leaders. And he also ran for the governor of New York City. More on that later. He built the Chicago Opera House in his sprawling personal estate, Xanadu. He was married and divorced twice, and yet he died alone inside the vast halls of Xanadu. It really feels like you need to say Xanadu in an old-timey voice. I don't know what to say. Kane was called both a communist and a fascist by his haters, though he identified himself as simply an American. And this is where the mystery of Citizen Kane is introduced. On his deathbed, Kane had a snow globe in his hands when he uttered his final word, Rosebud. Why would this mogul and influencer say that? What does it mean? And if we knew what it meant, would we be able to understand this mountain of a man? The newsreel footage ends and we're in the newsroom with a team of newspaper men, all of whom are in the dark. We never really see any of their faces. Even Mr. Thompson, the reporter who we'll be following for the remainder of this film, isn't shown to us outside of his silhouette. But it's Thompson who's assigned the story to find out what Rosebud really is means. In order to discover who Charles Foster Kane really was, Thompson heads out to gather information from people who knew Kane best. He'll interview Susan Alexander, Kane's second wife. He'll read through Mr. Thatcher's diary. Thatcher was Kane's legal guardian and sort of a business mentor to him. He'll spend time with Mr. Bernstein, one of Kane's business partners. He'll also speak with Jedediah Leland, one of Kane's only friends and another business partner of his. And finally, Thompson will go straight to Zan to do to interview Kane's butler. Now, Thompson intends to interview Susan Alexander first, but she's drunk and grieving and asks him to leave. Now, one of the interesting things about Citizen Kane is that it's told via a series of flashbacks to critical moments in Kane's life that are unveiled to us sequentially. In the script, there's a bit more jumping around in the timeline, but the film takes a more linear approach, starting with Kane's earlier years and finishing with his demise. Our first foray into the flashbacks covering Kane's eventful life come from Thompson reading Mr. Thatcher's diary. Remember, Mr. Thatcher was his legal guardian and his business mentor in some ways. Here's what we learn from Thatcher's diary. Kane's fortune initially came from a Colorado mining operation. Kane's mother and father were given a deed to a mine called the Colorado Lode. The mine was thought to be defunct, but it ended up having more minerals in 
in it, and therefore it made the Canes extremely wealthy. In 1871, Mr. Thatcher signed an agreement with the Canes that would also allow him to operate the mine and then pay them handsomely to restore mining operations. They signed that agreement with Mr. Thatcher. Charles was a young boy at the time, and his mother wanted him to have a better life. Part of the agreement that the Canes signed with Mr. Thatcher includes a clause that states that Thatcher will become Canes' legal guardian. The film and the script indicate that Charles' mother wants to send him off with Mr. Thatcher for two main reasons. One, his social status will be elevated, since he'll have a better education to go along with his fortune. And two, Charles's father will likely be, or already has been, physically abusive to young Charles, so she wants to get him away from his dad. The critical aspects of this flashback are young Charles seems carefree and joyous as he plays in the snow with his sled. When his parents tell him he'll be leaving with Mr. Thatcher, Charles doesn't want to go. In fact, Charles shoves his sled into Thatcher's stomach to keep him away. We'll highlight the significance of this action later, but just know that it's a critical piece to understanding the story of Citizen Kane. In my opinion, the end of this flashback where Kane is removed from his family and taken to New York by Mr. Thatcher is plot point one. Kane goes from a poor boy in Colorado to a rich playboy and soon to be mogul in New York. And the final shot of that flashback is a shot of Kane's sled sitting alone in the snow. That's the end of act one and now we will transition into act two. Thompson is still reading Thatcher's diary and it jumps ahead to reveal that Kane is now 25 years old and now eligible to start receiving his fortune. Kane asks Thatcher if he can buy the New York Inquirer, a newspaper. Thatcher discourages it, but Kane is dead set on it and buys it anyway. Kane takes over the newspaper with Jedediah Leland and Mr. Bernstein as his business associates. His first order of business is rewriting the vision of the paper to be more about communicating the truth to the masses. At least that's kind of how he puts it. I'm paraphrasing, but it's kind of how he puts it. But there's one super important thing to note here. When Kane starts to talk about the stories he's going to write, the former editor-in-chief of the newspaper indicates that the stories Kane wants to tell are really more like tabloid stories, not the well-vetted stories for which the Inquirer, the paper he's buying, is known. But Kane fires the old editor-in-chief and moves forward with his vision anyway. We then get a series of shots where we see Kane releasing story after story, showcasing how Mr. Thatcher treats his customers in nefarious ways. It's essentially a series of hit pieces targeting his former legal guardian. Thatcher, angry at being targeted, obviously, confronts Kane about it. And for the first time, we realize that Kane has some deep-seated resentment for Thatcher. In this encounter, Kane even says to Thatcher, if I hadn't been rich, I might have been a great man. To which Thatcher replies, what would you have liked to be? Charles answers, everything you hate. That is such an intense thing to say. One note I want to make here, the series of shots where Thatcher is reading all the slanderous reporting coming out of the New York Inquirer, Thatcher keeps breaking the fourth wall and looking directly at the camera. It's sort of an odd technique that honestly doesn't seem to fit with the rest of the film, but since we're supposedly reading Thatcher's diary, I guess there's an excuse to use that technique here. It just feels a little odd or maybe out of place. I wonder what you think. Leave me a comment down below. When that flashback ends, Thompson has read the diary and hasn't learned anything about Rosebud from that diary. So he heads over to see Kane's former business associate, Mr. Bernstein. That sets off a whole other series of flashbacks. Kane writes a manifesto for the Inquirer that implies he's going to give his audience the truth. I mentioned that earlier, but the important part is Leland takes the manifesto as an heirloom. So Kane actually writes it out on a piece of paper and Leland says, I want to have that. This is a momentous occasion and I want to document it by taking that back. We'll talk about that later. The flashbacks then fast forward six years later. The Inquirer has become New York City's most widely circulated newspaper. Shout out to anyone who gets that reference. I didn't do a very good job. But if you get the reference, it's awesome. We can be friends. And Kane goes on to hire all of the top newspaper men. Sorry, ladies, this is the Roaring Twenties, and only men can be newspapermen. I don't know. 
And those newspaper men come from his biggest rival in New York, the Chronicle. But we've learned several important things about Charles Foster Kane. He has a clear vision and he is extremely charismatic. Those two traits combined with his wealth draw a lot of people to him. He's extremely influential. Now, as Kane's celebrating all of this, he actually decides to leave New York to go overseas, partially as a vacation and maybe because he also wants to collect artifacts from around the world that he's later going to put into his Xanadu estate. But this is early on in his life and he's just collecting artifacts from around the world and taking a trip. I should also note that he's very into collecting artifacts from his own past in Colorado, which will again become more important later. When Kane returns from his trip abroad, we actually see that there's a woman on his staff now. Now, a social reporter. Congrats, ladies. You can now vote and work. But Kane has another surprise that he's about to share. He's now engaged to Emily Norton, the niece of the U.S. president. And the inside joke or rumor here associated with Emily is that this marriage might actually be a political move to give Kane more clout. Maybe one day he can be president of the United States. So all of these flashbacks are happening because Thompson is talking to Bernstein. And the last thing that Bernstein says to Thompson is, maybe Rosebud is something that he lost. Mr. Kane lost almost everything that he had. Our faceless investigative reporter, Thompson, leaves Bernstein and goes to chat with Jedediah Leland. Fun fact, Jedediah's first name in the script is Branford. Leland, who was once Kane's best friend, is now old and lives in the hospital. In the script, Kane, Bernstein, and Leland are also referred to as the Three Musketeers because they were so influential in building Kane's empire. Leland tells Thompson that Charles Foster Kane was only ever really out for himself and that he never really had any true beliefs or convictions except for Charlie Kane, meaning that Kane was extremely self-focused. I would go so far as to say Leland is essentially calling Kane a narcissist without actually using that term. Leland believes that Kane's media empire wasn't built to tell the truth, as his manifesto said, but it was rather built as a platform for Kane to gain more influence and power. To prove that point, Leland says, I never believed anything in the Inquirer. Leland picks up the story of Kane's first marriage where Bernstein left off. He explains how Emily and Kane grew apart. Emily realized that Kane only married her to climb the social ladder. We know Emily's marriage to Kane is in real trouble when we see a shot of the two of them at opposite ends of their dining table. Kane is reading The Inquirer, his own paper, but Emily is reading The Inquirer's primary competitor, The Chronicle. Clearly, they're no longer getting along. At this point in the film, everything starts to shift. The remaining part of the story reveals how Kane lost everything. Prior to now, he's been rising the ranks, but now it's all about to come tumbling down. And here's how all of that happens. First, Kane meets Susan Alexander and begins to have an affair with her. Second, Kane runs for governor of New York against Jim Geddes, who's a political boss in New York, meaning he likely has a strong constituency and a good shot at beating Kane. But Charles, with all of his charisma, power, and influence, seems to be actually winning against Geddes. I do want to reference here that we do get a scene in the film where we realize that Charles Foster Kane has a son. Kane doesn't seem very interested in his son. And if Kane isn't interested in him, then Thompson our investigative reporter that we're following throughout this story isn't interested in the kid either. So basically, we're never going to see this kid in the movie again. He's just referenced very shortly. But it also goes to show you a little bit more um, of what Leland's talking about in terms of Kane being maybe a narcissist. So at this point of the film... Kane is sort of on top of the world and about to expand his influence by becoming the governor of New York. But that all comes crumbling down. How? Well, Geddes, Kane's number one political adversary I mentioned earlier, finds out about Susan Alexander and then forces Susan to write a letter to Emily confessing that they're having an affair. In what I think is the most dramatic scene in the film, Emily and Kane go to see Susan at her apartment. Guess who's waiting for them? Gettys. This is a huge deal. The two gubernatorial candidates meet face to face and Gettys tells Kane that he's finished. Gettys is upset because Kane kept slandering him in the press. 
So he's going to make sure that Kane is unelectable. He's going to let the world know about Kane's affair. And he does. And this is the moment where Charles Foster Kane's life begins to unravel. Emily divorces Kane, who loses the election. When Kane loses the election, the Inquirer's front page alleges fraud. And that headline proves Leland's earlier point. The Inquirer was never about telling the truth. It was about benefiting Kane. Kane presumably lost the election because Gettys leaked his affair to the press, which was in, in Kane's control to not get involved in an affair, but of course he did. And while that might be considered unethical, leaking that information to the press, it certainly wasn't fraud. But Kane can't be seen as losing to Gettys, so he declares the election was fraudulent. Something we've never before seen in American politics. Kane losing the election, in my opinion, is the midpoint of the film. The first half of the film is about how Charles Foster Kane rose to power. The second half of the film will show how he lost it all. And the mystery of his last spoken word, Rosebud, remains unsolved. After losing the election, Kane marries Susan Alexander. In one of their earlier meetings, Susan told Kane that her mother thought she was a good singer. Kane decides to dedicate his time and money to making sure that Susan is an opera star. He even builds an opera house in Chicago and produces an opera with Susan as the lead. But there are three problems that arise with Kane's new goal of turning Susan into an opera star. One, Susan doesn't have the talent to be a star. Despite Kane hiring the best teachers in the world to train her, she's just not good enough. Two, Susan doesn't want to be a singer. She knows she isn't good enough and feels like she's a fraud. And three, the biggest problem of all, Kane isn't doing any of this to benefit Susan. He's doing it to prove that he can have whatever he wants. He's doing it for himself, which we'll get into a little bit later. Now, Kane's newspapers, because he's still a media mogul, all publish glowing reviews of Susan and the opera, but all of his competitors deride the show and Susan's talent. There's also a scene, which actually comes much earlier in the screenplay, where Kane finds Leland writing a scathing review of the opera. Leland has passed out drunk at his typewriter when Kane and Bernstein find him. Kane takes the article from the unconscious Leland and decides to finish it himself. Interestingly enough, he keeps the scathing review intact and writes Leland's review as Leland intended. At the end of Leland's interview with Thompson, Leland admits that he doesn't know what Rosebud means either. While Thatcher's diary seemed to showcase Charles Foster Kane as a young man who wanted to make a name for himself, and Bernstein's comments seemed to paint Kane as a shrewd mogul, Leland has shown us that Kane was entirely self-focused. We now have three important aspects of who Kane is, but no indication of what Rosebud could be. Thompson then goes back to Susan Alexander to see if she knows anything about Rosebud. Susan continues the flashbacks where Leland left off. In those flashbacks, Susan sees Leland's article in the paper the following day, and it's a scathing review of her performance and the show. And she rants about how angry she is about it. She doesn't know, nor does Kane tell her, that he was the one who actually finished the article for Leland. Kane then receives a package in the mail from Leland. Kane opens it and finds the manifesto he wrote when he purchased the Inquirer, the same one that Leland took from Kane and said, I'm going to take this as a momentous occasion. Now, this is a slap in the face. Despite the manifesto sounding like the Inquirer would be a truth telling publication, Kane's newspaper doesn't tell the truth at all. And Kane, in anger, tears up the piece of paper that he wrote all those years ago when he bought the Inquirer. Now, Susan, tired of everyone critiquing her for a career that she hates, attempts to kill herself by overdosing on drugs. But Kane finds her in time and gets her some help. And then they both move to Xanadu and become complete recluses. Susan spends her time constructing jigsaw puzzles while Kane broods. Kane does decide to throw a giant picnic in the Everglades, but during that party, Susan confronts him in their shared tent. She doesn't like what their lives have become and she wants to leave. During the fight, Kane says, whatever I do, I do because I love you. Susan's reply showcases a core truth about Kane when she says, you don't love me, you just want me to love you. 
That statement represents a critical understanding of Kane's character and unlocking the mystery of Rosebud, but we'll, of course, come back to that. What's Kane's response to Susan? Well, he slaps her. That's when Susan declares she's leaving him and she's going to do it in front of all of their guests. He protests and tries to keep her there by telling her that she can have whatever she wants. Susan responds to him, it's not about me, it's about what's being done to you. I think Susan divorcing Kane is plot point two, which forces the story to move toward its inevitable resolution, which we saw all the way back at the beginning of the film. Charles Foster Kane will die alone inside his bedroom at Xanadu. At the start of Act 3, Kane is now alone within the vast halls of Xanadu, and he's lost everything. Now, Thompson, who's been interviewing Susan Alexander, leaves and travels to Xanadu and talks with Kane's butler as crews inventory all of Kane's artifacts. Kane's butler thinks he might know what Rosebud means, but it's soon evident that he doesn't have any clue what it means. He gives Thompson some additional info on the last moments of Kane's life, but none of it reveals what Kane's final word really meant. In one flashback, right after Susan has left him, Kane tears Susan's room apart, and as he does so, he finds a snow globe, the same one he has on his deathbed later. When he picks it up, he looks off into the distance as if remembering something, and then he utters the infamous word, Rosebud. Thompson leaves the butler and ponders what it all means. He's flummoxed. He has no leads on what Rosebud meant to Charles Foster Kane. Was it a former lover, something related to the Inquirer or Xanadu? Was it another old artifact? He'll never know. Thompson comes to the conclusion that Rosebud really didn't mean anything at all, that it was just a minor piece of the complex jigsaw puzzle that was Charles Foster Kane's life. Now the camera starts to pan over the vast collection of artifacts that Kane has collected. It's rooms upon rooms full of boxes and crates, enough to fill multiple museums. This shot almost feels like the inspiration for the last shot of Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, where a worker places the Ark of the Covenant inside a huge warehouse full of similar crates. They've got a Similar feeling to them, these two scenes. But as the camera pans, it then zooms in on two workers. They're burning the worthless pieces of Kane's collection. They pick up a sled and toss it into the furnace. The camera zooms into the furnace to reveal the name written across the sled. Rosebud. Now, before I explain the significance of that scene and the meaning of the sled, let me say a few things about this film. One, we never really see Thompson's face. It's always in shadow or not facing the camera. I love that because this mystery isn't about the investigator. It's about the subject, Charles Foster Kane. By never making it about the investigative reporter, Citizen Kane remains focused on the mystery and the larger-than-life character whose life we're unraveling alongside Thompson. We're seeing the world through Thompson's eyes, and it's more important that we see Charles Foster Kane and not the detective. Two, the camera angles, miniatures, and flashbacks are all done beautifully and have inspired generations of filmmakers. Three, the script jumps around in the timeline of events more so than the film does, which is an interesting technique, but I think it was wise to present the timeline in a more linear fashion as the film does because it doesn't distract from the deeper narrative. And finally, the use of visual cues throughout the film is fantastic. There are so many subtle things Citizen Kane reveals via the visuals alone. Newspaper headlines, character expressions, and even the final shot of the sled don't beat the audience over the head. All those nods are subtle, and the audience has to pay attention to understand them all. I love that. All right, now let's unravel the mystery that Thompson never solves. Why did Charles Foster Kane, Citizen Kane, say the word rosebud on his deathbed? Well, here's my take. The most pivotal moment in Kane's life was when his mother and father became wealthy. At that moment, thinking that they were making the right decision, they gave their son over to Thatcher. That moment was the moment where Kane lost control. Seconds before that, Kane was a poor kid playing in the snow with his sled. But when he discovers that his life will change forever, he'll be rich and mentored by a wealthy businessman. What's Kane's reaction to that news? He takes something he loves, his sled, and puts it up between him and his inevitable future. 
stature. For the remainder of his life, Cain tries to control his own destiny. He uses people and destroys relationships, all in order to maintain that control. And as his power and influence grows, he sees more opportunities to take control of more things. But ultimately, that quest for control will drive his most valued relationships away from him, leaving him alone with the things that he's accumulated. Which is why the one thing that Cain owned that serves as his last memory of freedom and innocence was his sled, Rosebud. But that sled, which represents his freedom and innocence, was taken from him. After that, Cain decides that he will take control of his own destiny, no matter the cost. He launches a media company and disparages Thatcher. He marries Emily because of her connections to major political players, in this case, the president. He runs for governor in an attempt to gain influence and maybe even run for president down the road. He marries Susan and tries to turn her into an opera star to prove he can still control anything that he needs to control. He builds Xanadu to showcase that he can possess whatever he wants. But in the end, he remembers a time in his life when things were good when he laughed and played in the snow with his sled, Rosebud. The ultimate premise of Citizen Kane is that the ruthless pursuit of control devours one's soul and crushes one's relationships. Kane reflects back on that pursuit, realizing it all started when he lost Rosebud and lost control of his own destiny. I kind of wonder if Orson Welles was reflecting on the public's view of important and influential people. When we look at celebrities or famous figures, do we see them as people or do we see them as impossible, larger-than-life characters that we can't relate to? Kind of like how Thompson sees Citizen Kane or, or Charles Foster Kane. Maybe what Orson Welles is telling us is that those people are not much different than you or me. It's just that they've had a few other things happen to them in their lives and their lives got out of control. Does Citizen Kane hold up all these years later? I think so. It does feel slow in places, but overall Citizen Kane made its mark on Hollywood for generations to come and definitely deserves attention for doing so. Did I miss anything? If so, or if you have a question that I didn't address, please leave your thoughts in the comments down below. And if you're not subscribed, please be sure to hit the subscribe button. Thanks for watching. And if you have a film that you'd like for me to explain, please let me know. And that, folks, was News on the March. We'll see you next time.